with a door. One, two, three, four. Ready to play? Watch the day. There's a steamer coming to pick us up and take us home later on. Meanwhile, we're having a small picnic. Strawberries and cream. Mm. Mmm, they're lovely. Humpty's already had one helping. If he has any more, there won't be enough for Marla. Today we're interviewing Johnny Ball from TV's Play School and Think of a Number. You started out as a, red, a Buckley's Red Coat, didn't you? Yeah. Did you always want to be an entertainer? Yeah, yeah, I did. And um, I... I... Went in the forces when I was 18 and signed on for three years because I wanted to get a full experience and if you sign on you, you get choice of your career and everything. And that was great, that was my university and I came out and uh, I could have gone into air traffic control from my experience in the area, but I knew what I was going to do and I went straight to Buslins. I applied and got in and uh, the red coat at Buslins and I did three years of that. I'd seen a guy when I was eight years before, I'd seen a guy also do that and so I followed him and his name was Des O'Connor so that's what I did and then for eight years I was determined to do that and I did it yeah. So were your family quiet and were they entertainers as well? But my dad would have been a wonderful comedian if he'd ever got the chance but he never had the chance really um, and he was an iron founder all his life and um, but he, he when, when comedians when I was a comedian met my dad he used to say he's funnier than you isn't he? <laughs> you about science originally what any particular aspect no it, no I just love maths but from the beginning because once again my dad taught me um, lots of maths tricks um, playing fives and threes dominoes we had double nine we had double nine dominoes my dad always said double seven double six dominoes are just for wimps <laughs> double nine dominoes you play and we played double nine dominoes and they were a great teaching aid for me when I was only about four mm. five I've still got the set we play with. I'm looking at it now, it's across the room, there it is. And it's still the set that I played with uh, 70, 76 years ago. Yeah. Were you quite good at maths at school? Yeah, I was, because because of my dad's opening up maths to me, and hmm. me having no fear of it. Yeah, I was, I was always top in maths, yeah. You went from Butler's to playing a lot of the uh, clubs, didn't you, in the north? That's right, yeah, out of Liverpool. Oh, right, was that quite because I've heard horror stories about that, that sort of time? And... They, were, they were wonderful. Yeah. It was, there, there was an agent uh, called Mike Hughes, and he, he knew several of the people who were redcoats, who were also comedians during the uh, autumn and the winter. And uh, he was ticked off about me, so I started working for him. As soon as I, and in the wind, in, as soon as I left Buckingham, really, in 62. And I started working with him. We're just doing Saturdays and Sundays in working men's clubs. Mm. And I built it up. And then I turned pro in January 64. Mm. And, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was when I started uh, and was turned pro. Yeah. So how did that lead to television work? Uh, by 67, I'd already been here. I, I did the Rolling Stones. I did the Dusty Springfield tour, I compared them, in 64. Literally a few months after turning pro. Mm. And I was very successful. So they gave me the Rolling Stones tour. I compared that in 64. But that was full of screaming kids. So I never heard of where they slept for three weeks. So <laughs> it was pretty pointless. Um, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's where it all started. Um, but I was got better in the clubs. And by 67, I was very strong in the clubs. And, you know, one of the strongest comedians in clubs. So it was only natural that eventually people would start looking at me for television. Um, you know. And so we got an offer. Well, they wanted to see if anybody was interested in working with BBC Children's Television among the comedians who, who did radios out of Manchester. So we thought it would be for Cracky Gang. So I went to the uh, interview. I knew I'd got it. I knew I'd got the job within three minutes. He said, you're going to be great on Play School. 
And he said, from the five. I said, what? Well, he said, yeah, I'll be busy too, 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, ah, oh, I'm not interested. And I tried to walk out. And he got me to come back, and he got me to uh, do the audition, and I did it. And when I did it, at first it wasn't very good, because I didn't want to do it. I realised the integrity of the people who did it was lovely. They were just lovely people. So, and suddenly I thought, I can learn television from here, can't I? And that's what I did. So I joined play school, and I actually stayed 16 years. But while I was there, I could do anything else I wanted. You know, I did lots of other things, and I would I would have a couple of months off while I was doing other things, and I'd come back and do more play school. Mm. So it was lovely in, in that respect, because it, it earned quite well. Yeah. And uh, and cushioned me from the bad clubs, which I was going to do. But I loved the clubs. I absolutely loved the clubs. And it, it did very well everywhere, virtually. And so it, it wasn't daunting at all. How did you take to television then? Was it must have been quite a change from? Well, at the same time I got play school, I also got the ITV Christmas Night Spectacular, which is an hour and a half show, and that was recorded in um, late November for Christmas Night, an hour and a half show. I compared that to Bud Flanagan was on the show, and I was right. the last person to ever do a double act with Bud Flanagan mm. on television because he died on, not only a few months later. Um, and uh, it was a star-studded bill, but I was compare. But to be honest, I didn't really break any pots. I was very, a very mild sort of compare, you know, and, mm. and uh, almost quiet. So it didn't, it didn't break any pots. And, and it was for a film called Ready Fusion. And they lost the franchise to London Weekend and Thames Television. That's when they lost it. I was in '67. Mm. So they didn't do the 13-part series where they were, they were thinking of doing with me from the January, it, that never happened. But once I got that program, my my agent also got me uh, an interview for the Val Dunican show. Mm. And I did that uh, the following week, which was terrible because I wasn't even in the Radio Times. Nobody knew I was on. When I, it was live to 19 million viewers, and after the second joke, the camera broke down. Oh, God. So I moved to another camera a total mess and mm. I moved towards him with the camera and the camera moved towards me and suddenly I'm standing in the dark I wasn't in my light anymore and uh, it was disaster I mean absolute disaster so that should never never have happened I should have never done that show so I left my agent and it all changed from then um, but yeah I, I, I knew somebody a neighbour a friend of mine who was into science and technology mm. and I used to go to meetings at the Royal Society with his group and he said, he said, you're a natural. He said, you shouldn't be doing comedy. You should be doing science and mathematics. So that's how it started. I, I, they asked me what show, I, what I would do if I had my own show. And I said, I think I'd do a program on maths. Mm. And I did think of a number. That's one of my favourite shows as well. I grew up with those sort of shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were wonderful. Nobody knew what we were doing, you see. My, my, my director, Albert Barber, and I, we just dovetailed, absolutely dovetailed. So I would say what I wanted to do, and while I was saying it, he would draw the set. <laughs> he would draw the set, now he could do it, you know. And, uh, and the crew in Bristol were brilliant, did amazing things for us, you know. So uh, it was very successful. Did you plan the shows yourself? I wrote them all. Oh, you did, yeah. I wrote them all. I wrote all the things when I was thinking. Yeah. I wrote most of Play Away as well. Oh. I wrote the comedy for Play Away. Mm. And that's how, when they asked me to do my own series, because they realised I was writing a lot and not getting enough airtime. So uh, they thought we'd better find a show for him. So <laughs> we did think of a number and then think again and all the other spin offs. On the play school, um, what was the filming like? Did you, because it was on every day, wasn't it? I mean, I know you wasn't on every single show. Yeah, you do a two, you do two a day. Yeah. You do, you do five in, in two and a half days. Oh, right. Um, you record them, yeah. And they and suddenly, they were, soon they were being recorded.
repeat it with the wedding in colour, we were the first programme in colour, because it, colour should have started the night before, but there was a strike, the BBC strike. So we were the first programme to go out the following morning at 11 o'clock in colour was, was play school. I was on it, I think I was on it. Anyway, I was on very, very soon, and we did that. Then they started repeating our shows at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So we got a lot of money. So doing play school, we actually were well paid. Because every time you did it, you did five shows with five repeats, and the repeats were seventy-five percent of the original fee. Right, I see. So it was it was a sensible thing to do. That's why people like Derek Griffiths did it, and, and myself, because both Derek and I had lots of demands for careers in all different kinds of directions. Some people did play school and didn't do much else, but but we you know, we I, I was the only person to resign from play school. Oh really? What happened? And I said I can't do it anymore. I've got too much work on because I was writing three series of programs and performing them each year. And uh, but I was also doing lectures and all kinds of things around the place. And uh, I, I said no, I, I can't. I haven't got any. I can't do anymore. I'm sorry. And I was the only person that ever resigned. Was it quite tough uh, recording the the shows because they had to be uh, filmed quite quickly, weren't they? Yeah, but no, it's all right. I I wrote wrote scripts for the thing. Think shows. I wrote the script for, for, for play school. Frankly, I could look at the script and then knew it. Mm. You get so so good at it. You you just don't have to think, and you just it just goes in. You know, mm. I'm very good at learning lyrics of songs and things. And I and you know I, I've got a good retentive memory, so I had no trouble at all. I could do it. New, I could look at, do it almost effortlessly, really. But the think of a number shows and the think again shows. That was different because I wrote them and as I rehearsed them, so I strengthened them. And then and then we made programs about 35 minutes long, but our slot, slot was 27 minutes, 28 minutes. So we had to squeeze it down to that. So I squeezed it down as much as I could by cutting out any waffle and keeping it really strong and really firm. And then we'd still be over and the red rest, of, rest was done in, in editing. So they were very strong programs. It was great. When I finished them, Tomorrow's World asked me to do Tomorrow's World, and I said, "Can I write my own show, uh, my own big pieces?" They said, "No, you'll have a writer." I said, "But I've just written twenty series of television programs." And they said, "But you're a good presenter." I said, "Could it be I'm a good presenter because I've had good scripts?" <laughs> so I turned them down three times, and I couldn't transfer to adult television. But that was all right because. By the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, the corporate world would be in a path to my door, you know. So I worked for National Grid for six years, mm -hmm. British Gas three years, BA Systems four years, doing lectures and things, so all kinds of things. I wasn't, wasn't full-time. I would do several weeks a year with, with National Grid. It was only about eight days a year. But they were very intense days, and they paid me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. so, so so that was it, and I did videos for all kinds of people. I won the Sales Video of the Year Award with something I wrote and presented. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a good time. And then I wrote five educational stage musicals because I was out of television now, and BBC Children's Television had collapsed. It was no longer what it had been, and I didn't want to be part of it, so I walked away. And I worked for Central, but I didn't like that very much, and didn't have enough control, so I walked away from that. So, about 93, I wrote a stage musical for the Michael Friday All Electric Roadshow. Mm. That took over three years with National Grid subsidising it. Yeah. And then I had the bug down, so I wrote another one called Let the Force Be With You. <laughs> that done very well. And then in 2000, I had um, Tales of Mass and Legends, which was the British uh, our main event in the maths year 2000. Um, effort which was worldwide and had Tony Blair who was prime, prime, um, prime minister there on stage at the opening of that. So I did that and that played to 160,000 kids that year. Mm. But I also had a show in the Dome which I wrote and produced. I had five actors there and that was in the Dome and that sold every single place for the year 2000 and nobody knew about it because it only went to schools. Mm. It was from students from nine up to 18. Mm. And uh, it, it got raised, but nobody ever knew about it. <laughs> so I'm, I was doing ever so well. 
But nobody knew. People thought he's always dropped out of television. What's he doing? You know. Mm. But actually, I was earning fortune, much more than I'd ever earned in television. So yeah, it was, uh, they were good years. Ninety-three to two thousand three were tremendous years for me. Do you think you ever missed your calling? Did you ever think that uh, you should have been a teacher? I mean, no, I know you, I know you never, were. On. No, never, because yeah. I've never had the same audience twice. Oh, yeah. You know, if I had to teach the, the same audience all the time, I, it would be very difficult. Mm. Also, the, the curriculum is far too narrow at any one time, and it uh, drives me mad, you know. Mm. I don't even, when I talk now, because I, I do lots of conferences, thing, uh, I don't talk about the curriculum. I talk about where I think kids should be, what you should be teaching them at this age. There's a thing in the Times only last week, and it showed um, kids in the 70s and 80s that did their maths exam, and the maths exam for the millennials. Yeah. Mm. And it's far easier today. It's far easier because it's taught slower. Yeah. And because it's taught slower, you don't get people enthusiastic enthusiastic about it. So we're producing less scientists and less mathematicians really. Mm. Um, or quality ones. So it's it's yeah, it's not good at the moment. Do you think that television in general, because this is my pet peeve, right? Um, um, I think that um, the the growth of sort of mass media uh, has, has pretty much ruined a lot of things. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the music. I, I think it has. I, I, I do think so. Um, but I thought this a long time ago, I thought this would happen. I thought it's the same with music because now you can get all your music free. Nobody buys the records anymore. Yeah. Which is why all the old groups are still touring. Yeah. That's where they make the money now because they don't make the money as much on records because it's all, so much of it goes out free. And it's difficult to get the money back from it. So I saw that coming and I saw this mass produced television coming, you know. But in a way, we were suited to that because it was me and Albert Barber and a, and a couple of people who helped us, a little team of five, six perhaps, you know, plus a television crew. And we made all our programs and it was neat and it was lean and, uh, you know, mm. so it, was, it didn't cost a lot of money. So when I made videos, I did that the same way. And my videos were very strong, you know. Mm. Um, I made videos on uh, PAYE, and the PAYE, you know, the, the tax people. Mm. And they said, oh, you can't make this interesting. And they went, I made it, they said, my God, it's wonderful. It's brilliant what you've done. Here. So so I, I, I did lots of things like that. So I had a good time doing that. And I'm still doing it. I've still got a... Uh, energy company want me to do a thing over this in January. I think we'll do it in January. Mm. So they still come on for things like that. Right. It's, um, so, so how did Strictly come about? Strictly? Well, I was always doing Strictly, but uh -huh. then they, they asked me out of the blue and uh, in 2012, and I, I said, yeah, I'll do that because my wife's a down season. Mm. But um, so I, we did that, and I, I did. I said, when they started announcing who was in the show, they hadn't announced me. And I knew I was on the shortlist, but they hadn't announced me to the press. And I said, you did it, aren't you? You're not sure. Why don't you bring me in? Because I was 74 then. And I said, why don't you bring me in and let me dance with one of the girls, one of the dancers? Mm. So they called, uh, they called Flavia in. So Flavia and I did the uh, um, cha-cha. And she showed the cha-cha. And then we did a quick step. Well, I'd done a quick step when I was at school, and and waltzes and and fox stuff. They're not very much fox stuff, and even tango. So they found I could do it all. So they said, "Oh, great, you're in." And she said, "You'd be great." So I'm still friends with her. Hmm. Did you get offered um, quite a lot of stuff like that now? Not really. I was the first person ever interviewed, ever first person interviewed for um, celebrity. Get me out of here. Really. And I, I was thinking about it, and eventually I turned it down, and they used Tony Blackburn, mm. and Tony Blackburn won it, the first series. So I might well have won it if I'd gone, mm. to, because that was the kind of person who does win it, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, more, more stable people. I don't know a desire to do it now. No. I did, did a bit of reality TV last year, um, and I don't like it. Just one last thing. Is there any roles that uh, came up over your lifetime that you regret not, not getting? No, uh, not really. No, I, 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 I've never wanted to be an actor. I've never, you know, yeah. I've never do that. I, 
I would have liked to have done what I did for children's in adult television, but they would never, never let me. You know, they, 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 it was, you know, it was to, to have written my own shows is very difficult. I, re, I wrote a book. I got a book out last year called um, Wonders Beyond Numbers, and that sold very well. And that would make a brilliant series, a great television series. So I'm still looking at trying to get that place, but I don't think I've got much chance. But I'm still looking, and I've got a few leads. Um, to, because it would make a great television program, and I'm so fit and healthy that I could make it. Mm. So, uh, so we'll see. But um, thanks a lot. You take care, mate. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.